Okay, I want to thank everybody for being here this afternoon. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, and I want to thank my colleagues who I'm standing up here with. I'm Sherry Bustos. I am a Democrat from the state of Illinois. And uh, who we have with us here today, um, it, uh, I'm really, really grateful to everybody standing in front of you. I'm especially grateful to Gretchen Carlson, who's uh, two to my left, two, uh, two to your right, um, for really having the, the courage to step forward and be here with us today to tell her story, at least what she can tell of her story. Um, it takes a lot of guts to stand up and be able to talk to people about sexual harassment. Um, it's because of you, Gretchen, and thousands of women like you who have said no more. Uh, that we, and today we are on the verge of making real progress on fighting sexual harassment in the workplace. I also want to thank uh, the rest of my colleagues who are here with me today. On the House side, we have Walter Jones, Pramila Jayapal, and Elise Stefanik. And then to my left, to your, uh, one to, you, to your right, uh, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, who has been an absolute champion on this issue. And also, Senator Graham, thank you so much for uh, being a co-sponsor of our bill today. Um, I couldn't wish for better partners to, uh, to be here for what we're announcing today. The name of our bill is Ending Forced Arbitration of Sexual Harassment. And before I tell you what this bill does, I want to tell you why it is so badly needed. The idea of this legislation came to me actually um, in February. It was a Monday night, and um, I'm reading the Washington Post. Thank you to our reporters. I'm a former reporter. Thank you to our reporters for uncovering what is going out there. Um, I read that night about a story that involved Kay Jewelry and Jared Jewelry and how they had a rigged system that allowed those in senior leadership to prey on women in the workforce. Here's what they reported. It detailed allegations of a chief, chief executive who would only promote women who would sleep with him. It shed light on an al alcohol-fueled manager's meeting where, of course, spouses were banned and where dozens of women would go there and they would be groped, they would be demeaned, they would be harassed. Oh, and by the way, these meetings were mandatory for these women. The report in the Washington Post painted a troubling picture of a corporate culture that fostered systemic sexual harassment. And once the women had had it, they were totally fed up, they were disgusted by this offensive behavior, and they finally decided that they were going to take action. So they did what women who were sharing these stories would do, and they decided to file a class action suit. But as you can see, by those of us standing in front of you, there's not one woman from K Jewelry or Jared Jewelry. And you know why? Because when they were hired, they filled out paperwork. Just like when you start any new job, you sign your name on the paperwork or you're, handle, you're handed an employee handbook. And it was slipped right under their nose, and that took away their right to sue. So instead, when they brought these issues up, they were forced into a secret arbitration process. And that meant that their stories would never see the light of day because of that employment agreement that they signed. Um, so this is why we've got to address institutionalized sexual harassment. And that's what we're here to talk about today. For every woman everywhere who knows exactly what sexual harassment feels like and looks like, that is why we are standing here. Our legislation is simple and it's straightforward. All this would do is say that if you are one of 60 million Americans who have mandatory arbitration as a condition of your employment, we think you ought to have a choice. We think that you ought to have an option to take your, court, your case to court. We know there are many good companies that are out there um, who would never think of doing the kind of things that I just told you about. And those kind of companies, they have nothing to fear in this. But to those CEOs and the managers who think that every day at the workplace ought to be like an episode of Mad Men, we've got a message for you. Stop it and stop it now. It's taken our nation a long time to reach this moment where we are here today. But we are here. And as you can see, we are united. We are men and we are women. We are Democrats. We are Republicans. We are senators. We are House members. So for everybody out there, for the waitress, for the journalist, for the factory worker, for all the women who go to work and all they want to do is do their job and do it well, we are here to say no more. No more looking the other way when powerful men 
victimize women. No more excuses for the abusers who abuse just because of who they are. No more telling women that they have to put up with harassment and stay silent any longer. No more. Um, and with that, I also want to say that we work in an institution where we are also saying no more. And we will be a part of making sure that that doesn't happen anymore here in the halls of Congress. Um, with that, I would like to introduce my friend on the Senate side who has been a leader on this issue from the state of New York, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. Thank you. Yes. Uh, well, thank you to all my colleagues standing here. Um, Senator Graham, thank you for joining with me in the Senate. Uh, I want to thank um, Congresswoman Bustos for her leadership. This is really important, and you've been determined to get this bill done. And I really want to thank Gretchen Carlson for uh, your courage as a survivor, as someone who's willing to stand here and tell your story, and having met with many survivors, having to relive the worst moments of your life publicly is really difficult. So thank you. Um, over the last year, there have been so many brave women, uh, just like Gretchen uh, and men, coming forward. And we've learned a very unfortunate truth, that sexual assault and sexual harassment in the workplace are much more pervasive than anyone could have thought. As we know, this is a problem in Hollywood, in the military, in politics, and right here on Capitol Hill. But it's also a problem where there is no spotlight, where there's no attention from the media, and where there may not be any options for a person who is harassed or wants to, and wants to leave for another job. Places like restaurants and factories and farms and buildings. All men and women out there who have already come out and publicly told their stories about sexual harassment and sexual assault in the workplace, there are no doubt many, many more who want to speak out who are already and are ready to speak out, but they can't because their employers don't let them. This reason, uh, the reason for this very unfair process is called forced arbitration. When a company has a forced arbitration policy, it means a worker is sexually harassed or sexually assaulted in the workplace. They aren't allowed to go to court over it. Instead, they have to go into a secret meeting with their employer to try to work out some kind of deal that really only protects the predator. They have to keep quiet. They are forbidden from talking about what happened to them, not just to the press, but even to their colleagues or coworkers. They will likely be paid far less in restitution than they would have gotten if they sued in court. And after all that, they are expected to go back to work and keep doing their job as if nothing happened. Or the other option, if they don't want to keep working with a predator, is to quit. Now that is not a fair choice, and one that should, no one should ever have to put up with. So I'm very proud to stand here with my colleagues on a bipartisan, bicameral piece of legislation to help fix the problem and to finally get rid of forced arbitration for people who have suffered through this. Our bill would finally make it illegal for employers to enforce these unfair policies, and this is a matter of basic fairness for workers. If Congress does, does its job and passes our bill, it would mean that when a workplace has a toxic sexual harassment or sexual assault environment for employees, those companies won't be able to hide it anymore. Serial predators will be less likely to be able to continue, continue to climb the corporate ladder, and employers won't be allowed to force their employees to stay quiet about the bad things that happen to them at work. Nothing ever changes here in Washington unless regular people stand up and demand it. And that's exactly what we're seeing in this moment. It's what's happening in the Me Too moment. People across this country are standing up, telling their stories, and demanding action. So I encourage you to keep raising your voices. Tell your story. We will support you. We will believe you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gretchen Carlson. Thank you, Senator. Since my story broke in July 2016, and I jumped off a cliff by myself, a tidal wave of women have joined me in courageously speaking out against sexual harassment and assault in the workplace. We are witnessing right now an empowerment revolution. Every woman still has a story, and that's outrageous in 2017. 
no matter our age, race, hometown, or job. I'm talking about police officers, waitresses, clerks, lawyers, doctors, members of our military, Hollywood actresses, journalists. From young girls in Alabama to the women who work in Congress. And every day we're learning more and more about powerful men using their positions to harass and intimidate us. Well, no more. Enough is enough. For the past year, one of my missions has been to meet here on the Hill with both Republicans and Democrats to let them hear my voice about why this bill is so imperative for safety in the workplace. This bill will get rid of forced arbitration for workplace sexual harassment and gender discrimination complaints. And it's absolutely essential to stop this. As you just heard from Congresswoman Bustos, 60 million Americans have forced arbitration <laughs> clauses in their employment contracts. They're a condition of employment, meaning that you can't get that job unless you sign on the dotted line. What's fair about that? But here's the real key. Forced arbitration is the harasser's best friend. It keeps harassment complaints and settlements secret. It allows harassers to stay in their jobs even as victims are pushed out or many times fired. It silences other victims from coming forward. They might have stepped forward if they would have known. I call your attention to the clause behind these members of Congress. This was actually in my lawsuit. It talks about how important it was to keep everything confidential. Who did that help? Forced arbitration is unjust. It's un-American. This will restore the rights for employees to a jury trial, their Seventh Amendment right, where they can choose to go to court if they want to. Thank you so much to the members of Congress who are standing up here with me today. From both sides of the aisle, this is essential. And imagine if we pass this in the House and the Senate, and it will land on the desk of President Donald Trump. Sexual harassment is not partisan because women from all walks of life and politics are targeted. This is what I've been saying when I meet with members of Congress. It's apolitical. Let's get on the right side of history with both parties. Because when somebody decides to sexually harass you, they don't ask you if you are a Republican or a Democrat or an independent like I am first. They just do it. And that's why we should all care. It's time for all of us to hold hands across the aisle and get something real done for women. Wouldn't that be amazing? Thank you so much. And now I'd like to introduce Senator Lindsey Graham. Well, uh, Senator Gildebrand, it's been a pleasure working with you on many things. And I look forward to our collaboration here, Walter. Thanks for being helpful in house to, to our members of the house. Uh, we're going to be a good team here. So what I'd like to see is the Chamber of Commerce come out for this. Yeah. I'd like okay. to see the Business Roundtable come out for this. Yes. That was strong. Let me tell you why. Okay. We just cut your taxes. I know that's good for business. <laughs> I think this is good for business. I think it'd be good for American business if the business community realized that pre-arbitration <clears throat> Mandatory arbitration before the claim is filed is not really smart. It may be good business, but we're going to make it bad business. So I've been a lawyer all my adult life. Uh, I've defended businesses. I've sued them. I've never liked this concept. Before the claim is made, you give up a legal right because you foster bad behavior, whether it's a bank cheating you or somebody harassing you in the workplace. So the reason people want these clauses is because it's good for them. The reason we need to get rid of these clauses, it'd be good for America. So we're gonna win. It's the question how we win. How much pain will you incur before we win? So this is an open invitation to the business community to get behind this bill because I think you'll be rewarded. Those who step forward, 
If nobody else, a lot of women will say, I want to do business with that company. And I think it would be great. Why am I here? I wouldn't want this to happen to my sister. I think a hostile work environment is only going to change when you bring about change. And to hope for change is not enough. You've got to actually make it happen. So this is a small step and a long journey, and we're going to win. It's only a matter of time and how. So we'll have a hearing in the Judiciary Committee, I hope, and the other side can tell their story as to why they want to keep mandatory arbitration regarding sexual harassment and sexual assault. I look forward to meeting those people, and we'll have a long, detailed conversation. I hope on the panel will be more than just politicians and activists who have suffered. I hope there'll be business leaders on the panel who will say, you're right, time has come for change, and the business community lead, needs to lead this change. You're going to lose if you fight this. The only way you can win is embrace this. Uh, now, my new best friend in the house, <laughs> we're on a first name basis because I can't pronounce her last name, Pramila. There you go. There you go. You did well. You did well. Beautifully done. Thank you for those excellent comments, uh, Senator Graham. And to my good friend Sherry Bustos and Senator Gillibrand, thank you so much for your, for your tremendous leadership. Gretchen, thank you. Um, I think it's very appropriate that the cover of Time Magazine as Person of the Year is celebrating and honoring those women like yourself that have stepped out and broken the silence. And to my colleagues here, it's a pleasure to be involved in this effort. As sexual harassment allegations royal industries across our nation, this does have the potential to be a watershed moment, but only if we actually take it as such, only if we actually use this moment to move forward legislation as the one that we are proposing today. From day one of many jobs, that prioritization and silencing of those who come forward begins. New employee onboarding materials, as you heard, often include these mandatory arbitration clauses that employees don't even know are there. They don't even know what they're signing. And instead of being able to take their employer to court and make their voices heard, they're not allowed to talk about the experiences as Gretchen's clause showed. Mandatory arbitration silences victims. It limits opportunity. It protects powerful men and it breaks the leadership ladders that we are all working so hard to put in place to help women succeed. Those who are forced to address sexual harassment in secret simply lose out. They're silenced from their co they're siloed from their coworkers and they're unable to tell their stories, unable to seek support from their networks, unable to even warn others of the predatory behavior that they've experienced. And when, we, and when they try to do some of those things, we've seen how they're heavily punished, including people like Gretchen, people who lose their jobs simply because they come forward. Many more victims of harassment remain silent, but leave their chosen fields. They decide we're not gonna put up with this, and so they, they leave, and we lose tremendous talent in all of those fields. So it is time for us to get rid of this mandatory arbitration in cases of s sexual harassment. And as has been said over and over, sexual harassment has no political party. Nobody is asked, but certainly as I look around this room and I see all the women who nod and in press conference after press conference about sexual harassment, the reality is that we as women understand that this is happening to all of us, of all political stripes, and it is time to change that. Nearly half of working women have been made to feel uncomfortable, undervalued, humiliated, exploited, or just plain angry. And while this happens in all industries, we have the opportunity to lead when it comes to effectively handling and preventing sexual harassment, and we must. And so change starts right here. It starts with this bill, and it starts right now. And with that, I'm very pleased to introduce my new best friend in the house, Walter Jones from North Carolina. It's easy to say. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much. I think uh, th what is so good about this presentation today certainly is not the subject matter. Uh, that is very disturbing. But the friendships that we're making and the fact that we're going to join as a team, uh, Republican and Democrat. And Sherry, I want to thank you and Gretchen and every one of my colleagues, House and Senate, for being here today. I, as I was listening to the other speakers before I had my opportunity, I thought about the time that I came here with Lindsey Graham in 1995 uh, as a conservative. I'm still a conservative. But when did I first get disgusted 
when I stopped listening to Fox News and I heard that Bill O'Reilly had been sued for phone sex, I made a decision then. This is for, for Gretchen's situation became public. I made a decision then I would no longer list, listen to Fox News. If you cannot correct a national leader in the media and reprimand that person who has been so disgusting that he would lean on an employee and have that kind of conversation. I said, no more, I'm through with them. So I did not listen any longer to Fox. I don't today, as a matter of fact. For me, forced arbitration is like going back to the dark ages. Obviously, I'm a male, but I think I can understand the pain physically and mentally of living in the dark ages and not having the ability to have light to come in on your pain. That's why this bill today in the House and the Senate I think is a journey. I think it is a journey of bringing sunshine and fairness to those women who for too long have not had an advocate in Congress like we have today, House and Senate. We're going to work together. We're going to do everything we can to bring the public in and have the public to demand of the House and Senate. You will hold hearings. You will pass this legislation, not only for the good of the women in the workplace, but for the moral good of America. That's why this is so important. And I am delighted to be a co-sponsor of this legislation, at least Stefanik uh, from New York uh, is now going to take, she is a Republican, she is an attorney, and she is now going to speak. And we're going to work in a bipartisan way to build the kind of support that Congress will have to say yes and not say no. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. And just to correct it, I am not an attorney, but I am a member of Congress. That's okay. Um, <laughs> I think we all can agree uh, that we are standing here today at a very concerning time in our nation. But it is also an opportunity for us to come together in a bipartisan fashion. Story after story continue to come forward detailing shocking realities about the pervasiveness of workplace sexual harassment. And I commend each and every brave man and woman who have stepped forward to shine a light on this epidemic. And I especially want to thank Gretchen Carlson for being one of the first to raise the awareness of this issue and showing the courage to share her personal story. We must do more as Congress and as a nation to protect our places of employment and ensure that men and women can pursue their careers and their opportunities safely. And we need to start that in this Congress. Last week, the House unanimously passed legislation to make sexual harassment and discrimination training mandatory in the House of Representatives. That is one step of many important steps we need to pursue to reform the process internally. Today, I am pleased to stand with my colleagues to join together on this bipartisan bill. This bill will protect victims by giving them the opportunity and choice to come forward publicly and have their stories heard. And more importantly, by shedding light and transparency on these crimes and their perpetrators, this bill will help prevent these disgusting crimes from ever taking place in the 21st century workplace. As policymakers, it's time for us to join together and put an end to sexual harassment and discrimination in the workplace. I'm honored to be a co-sponsor of this bill, and I will be working hard to gain more co-sponsors on the Republican side. Thank you, everyone, for being here today, and thank you, Sherry, for leading this effort in the House, and I want to turn it over to you. All right, very good. All right. Um, with that, 
we're going to stay on topic. I know there's some breaking news out there, but uh, you'll have some time to do that afterwards. So uh, on this topic, yes, sir. It was my wedding anniversary yesterday. So I know you were on the Red to Blue initiative, and you uh, obviously have, and the DCCC has been having a lot of things look at this too, and, and you had the initiative where you tried to recruit women. Did you ever talk to women or try to warn women about, uh, about uh, on the campaign trail about? This is supposed to be on topic. We're, to, we're Give us to on topic act. first. We'll do all out, off topic. <laughs> you've got your experts here, and Gretchen's here, so just ask first, and then we'll do others. Seriously? No, I'm talking Yes. Are, are you concerned that statements um, say that Governor Dunn is routinely regulating them as there already are, but too many regulations on campus with bad deals? Are you hearing any pushback from that? Uh, well, we're introducing it today. And um, I'll tell you what, one of my best moments standing in front of you was to hear Senator Graham do a shout out to the Chamber of Commerce and say, get on board with us. You know, look, we've had enough of this. We've had enough of it in Congress. Anybody who's a sexual harasser in these halls ought to go. Anybody who's a sexual harasser in the workplace and is using their position of power, um, they, shouldn't be, they shouldn't be leaders of their companies. And Senator Graham, I want to applaud you, especially as a Republican, to get up here and do a shout out to the Chamber of Commerce and say, get on board with us. <laughs> uh, so I think it's going to be good business in the future to move away from this. Now, this, this is an advantage that business has over employees. Mm -hmm. And all I can say is that pre-claim mandatory arbitration runs afoul of, I think, basic fairness, mm -hmm. disproportionate shift in power. I don't mind people arbitrating. Matter of fact, I encourage arbitration, but it needs to be meaningful. It needs to be collaborative. You shouldn't sign your rights away before you're harmed. So this does foster hostility in the workplace. The more exposure to a hostile work environment, the less there will be. The more you get hit in the pocketbook, the more change will come. So business is at a crossroads here. NFIB, Business Roundtable, Chamber of Com Commerce. I don't think you can make a case that this is good business. As a matter of fact, if you embrace the idea that we're going to do everything we can to stop a hostile work environment and we'll open ourselves up to claims uh, where we can tell our side of the story rather than shutting somebody out, I think they'll get rewarded. Uh, there's a Rubicon's been passed here, so I'm just asking the business community, for your own sake, if nothing else, help us lead America to a better business environment. And a better business environment is to be able to go to work without having to put up with a bunch of crap. And, and I would just yeah, add, go, go up here, a, a constitutional right is not unnecessary business regulation. Right. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, have you spoken yet with leadership about what the future of this bill might be in the United States? Well, our intention, what, what you see up here right now is th this took a lot of work. I mean, I, we started working on this in our office in, in March. And um, to get bipartisan support on a bill like this was, it took a lot of work. And to work across uh, on the Senate side, um, to, to Senator Gillibrand's credit, she jumped on this as soon as we started talking about it. Um, our, our hope would be, and you guys can speak to this, gets assigned to, to judiciary. Um, we work this through the judiciary, and then it comes to the full House for, for a vote. And, and, I, and I love the point that Gretchen made is, you know, we'll pass this, and this will go to uh, President Trump. And we would expect, if we make that happen, that he will sign this into law. Well, let's wait. Can let's we stay on topic for, yeah. for just a second? Because I know where this is going to go as soon as we get off topic. Yes. So that's an off topic, but I'll answer your question. So any more on topic? Yeah, we will get to that. I, I know that's... Uh, the f well, we don't have, we don't have forced arbitration. But, but Casey, to your point, we need to make this right here within, within the Capitol, when, within all of our offices. Um, again, as I stated before, and everybody can speak for themselves, but if you are a sexual harasser, go away. We, we don't want you. We don't want you as our colleague. Um, you know, our interns don't deserve that. Our staff doesn't deserve it. Uh, the women members of Congress don't deserve it. And um, so, you know, to your point, 
I, again, I, everybody's got to speak for themselves, but my view on this is, is this is not a place to, to be a sexual harasser within these walls. So to directly answer your question. Go ahead, um, Kirsten. So we have a bill that we're working on on a bipartisan basis uh, on both, in bi both chambers to address that issue because today if you are harassed in your office, you have to go to the Office of Compliance. The Office of Compliance, I don't even know where it is, and sometimes somebody's not even there. So you go there, the first thing you have to do is wait for a month to do mandatory counseling. Then you have to wait a month to do mandatory mediation with your harasser, and then you have a month of cooling off. So our bill will erase that three-month process that you can file your claim immediately. So in, a se in essence, we would be doing the same thing uh, here that we're trying to do in this bill for everybody else. And just to speak on some of the House efforts, House Admin is having a hearing on the process because it's ripe for reform. It needs to have reform. There needs to be transparency shed on the process. And we also need to ensure that victims to uh, Senator Gillibrand's point, know where to go and they're able to share their story to make sure that this isn't pervasive and continual. All right, one last question on topic. Sure, oh, okay, well, sorry about that. I, I'm gonna be just real quickly to your question. The leadership is gonna have to hear from the American people who are sick and tired of sexual harassment. We have a person running for the Senate that might win, might not win, that would be an embarrassment to the American people who believe in respect and fairness. We're going to have a journey, and with the help of the press that's here today, we're going to make sure that the American people know that the Congress does represent the people of America, and that means the woman who has been sexually harassed in the workplace. Thank you, Walter. Uh, last question on topic. Yeah. Are you talking about for the cases here within Congress? Yes. Well, again, I can speak for myself. There shouldn't be one cent of taxpayer dollars that are going to pay out uh, victims of, of members of Congress who are sexually harassing them. You might see overlap between sponsors, but they're two separate bills. Okay. Yeah, what, one is internal. Yeah, yeah, no, what, one focuses just on Congress. And the other focuses on the whole world. Okay. <laughs> the rest of the world. The world. One's America. for the world, one's for here. Um, all right. So now off topic, and I can't imagine what's going to be asked. Why don't we start with Casey? Yeah. Uh, Senator Gillibrand, <laughs> what was the tipping point for you and your colleagues? Well, obviously, there were new allegations today, uh, and enough is enough. I mean, this is a conversation we've been having for a very long time, and it's a conversation that this country needs to have. And I think when we start having to talk about the differences between sexual assault and sexual harassment and unwanted groping, you are having the wrong conversation. You need to draw a line in the sand and say none of it is okay, none of it is acceptable, and we as elected leaders should absolutely be held to a higher standard, not a lower standard, and we should fundamentally be valuing women, and that is where this debate has to go. I have expressed my views in a detailed op-ed that you can now have access to. I do not feel that he should continue to serve. Everyone will make their own judgment. Uh, I hope they do make their own judgment. You, you might want to stay there, Kirsten. I think probably well, don't you have your question? Well, probably answer? most questions are going to be for you, I'm guessing. <laughs> Senator Franken is entitled to the Senate ethics uh, investigation process, but I don't think Congress is equipped, I don't think they have the tools to do the kind of accountability that the American people are searching for. And as a mom who has to explain this to my children, as somebody who has to set an example for what co this country should be tolerating and not be tolerating, it's not equipped to do that. And so yes, of course he is entitled to that process, but I think it would be better for the country for him to offer that clear message that he values women, that we value women, and that this kind of behavior is not acceptable. 